human beings were designed to succeed. Oh, look at Jacob, so nice of you to show up. <laughs> I knew if I vamped long enough. Hold on, he's you know. been in the Benidorm room. Right. <laughs> right on time. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, thank you. We are the same. How to make an entrance. <laughs> That's how you succeed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, when I was. Um, thinking about reflecting on the topic for today, last night, four o'clock this morning, five o'clock this morning. Um, I was reminded of a story that uh, one of my teachers, Michael Neal, talked about. And uh, before I talk about that, I just have to say, my, my name's Steph, and I am a I am a recovering control freak. <laughs> so the story that Michael talked about was about a, a trainee, a young trainee pilot, who was on his first solo flight after finishing his hours. He'd done lots of hours, lots of training in this in this training plane, and he was halfway through this flight and he was in touch with the control tower and all of a sudden things began to to go wrong he started losing altitude he started going right and left and he began to get really anxious really really scared so what he did was he he, he held tightly to the control column and he was pulling it as hard as he could to try and get out of this what began to be a spin downwards and he, nothing was happening and he was pulling it left and right to try and correct it just wasn't wasn't working so he shouted to the control tower he said mayday mayday i'm 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 out of control i can't i can't pull out of this spin this is an emergency and the control tower guy behind the controls very calmly said, take your hands off the controls. There's a gyroscope designed to correct the plane. Take your hands off the controls. And it's, you don't understand. This is a matter of life and death. I really, really need help. What do I do? So the air control guy said, this is a matter of life and death. This is an emergency. Take your hands off the control. So he eventually got the message. Took his hands off the control and the plane did what it knew to do. It corrected itself. It started to climb. And the danger was past. And then the pilot learned a lesson. And what's interesting for me is that seeing it in the light of, of how we're designed to succeed, whatever succeed means, it's a good me it was a really good metaphor for me. Now, I'm not very good at talking about metaphors, but this, this was one that really struck me. Was that, you know, when we, when we take our hands off the controls, when we think that we are in control of our life, as, as I did. I, I used to try to control life so tightly. I used to try and maintain this construct that I had of how I thought my life should be and who I should be, who I thought I was. I suffered. And for me, the, the beauty of the metaphor is that um, it's not only when we let go of the controls do things begin to autocorrect. It's not even that we're piloting the plane. I think for me, what I saw was that, you know, 
we are the plane. We're being guided. All we need to do is hear the guidance. So one of my, <coughs> excuse me, one of my biggest teachers is my son. When Sam was five, he was at primary school in the UK, and his, he was a really happy boy, and he loved to draw, and he used to love drawing on his school books, <laughs> and the teachers didn't like him drawing on his school books, because he was supposed to be doing the work, you know, so he used to love and then it became apparent to them that something was wrong. You know, he was drawing all the time. He wasn't doing any work. He wasn't focused on achieving whatever it was he was supposed to achieve at the age of five or six. So they they um, they diagnosed him as being on the Asperger's scale, on the, the autism scale, the Asperger's end. And we would go, me and my wife would go to the, the parents' evenings and, and the teachers would just, I remember one teacher, the last teacher, slammed his book down and said, well, what am I supposed to do with that? And, it, and so very soon we became very worried. Um, the school recommended that we take him to a special school, they said that looking at his work and the way he was in class, he, he needed special schooling and he would never, <clears throat> he would never be academic. So we looked around some schools, we were very, very worried. We didn't see anything we liked in any other school, so we, we kind of ignored, <coughs> we ignored the, um, the request and Sam, Carried on primary school, carried on drawing and annoying teachers. And he, he eventually, you know, he, he, they, they didn't even put him in for his, his what we call the, the 11 plus exam, where they teach, you know, where, where, where you get streamed into the next school. So we were, he then went to his secondary school, and we were still very concerned, really worried. And he was recognised by a headmaster who was a, a really lovely guy and, and he recognised Sam's creative talent. So he nurtured that, he got the teachers to nurture that and, and Sam carried on drawing but something amazing happened. He, he then began to relax into the more academic work. It wasn't great, but at least he was he was engaged with it, which he wasn't before. <coughs> and then throughout his secondary school, Sam became more focused on his creative work. And and he he would lock himself away in his bedroom and wouldn't come down for for meals, you know. Again, me and his mum and the whole family, we were really worried and we wouldn't spend a long time trying to convince him that he should be out playing football, or he should be out making friends, he should be doing everything that, that we thought he should do in order to be a successful human being. And then, he, he, he has a very sweet way about him, Sam. He, he never, he, you know, when, when we asked him to do things, he, he, he would be really respectful and he would be really cute and he would totally ignore us. <laughs> we carried on.
carried on being worried. We carried on trying to change him. And he carried on staying in his bedroom. He played video games. He would be creating. He would be drawing all the things that we thought were taking him away from, from what we thought we wanted for him. By the time he came to leave secondary school, we had teachers, we had, uh, we had teachers coming in after school to try and teach some subjects in order for him to make sure he passed his exams. He didn't take any notice. He took his exams and he, he passed all of them. Much to our amazement, he went to college and we spoke to the lecturers after the first, after the first uh, quarter where Sam had been learning at college. He was, he'd gone to college to, to, to learn animation. And the lecturer said to me, there's nothing we can teach him. Oh, I got really, I was so broken hearted. And he said, no, there's nothing we can teach him because he spent the last however many years, five or six years in his bedroom. He has learned how to draw. He's learned all the software that he needs to do the animation that he wants to do. He's learned all the special effects software to be able to make films. He's even teaching us how to use the software called Flash. <laughs> So Sam left college with, um, he, he passed everything with the highest marks it was possible to pass. He's, he's 19 now and he's at university and we were, <laughs> we were really worried about him being interviewed at, at university because Sam has, you know, he, he calls it social anxiety, he, he has trouble speaking to people and making himself understood. So again, we tried to coach him in what to say, how to be understood. So he went to three, he was offered, or rather, he went to three universities and <clears throat> all he did was he just showed them what he'd been doing, he talked about that. And he was offered three places. He's been there for two years now, and he's, his, his lecturers are, they're just, they're just blown away by his ability to express himself in, in film, in drawing. And it struck me that all the time Sam was listening to his guidance, all the time he was he was the plane and he was being piloted. We were the ones that were trying to grab hold of the controls. We were the ones that, that had this idea of what he should be and what he should do and how his life should be. We were the ones trying to grab the controls away from him. But in his sweet way, he, he, he could completely had the ability to not pay attention to the noise, to the noise that we were, to the expectations and the shoots that, that we were presenting for him. And he, he listened to the signal, he listened to his, his own GPS, his own guidance system. That is why he's my biggest teacher, and that's what is so beautiful to me, to be able to see that that, that is how it works. Well, we're, we're the plane, we're not the pilot. We don't have to hang on to the controls, like I used to think I had to. 
And when, when we realise that, life unfolds beautifully. So we're the plane. Well, we were having a discussion over breakfast, Sue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I don't know if you were or not. But we were discussing uh, the title of this particular panel. Would you read it for us? Um, oh, no, not my notes. Okay. Um, human beings are designed to succeed. Yes. So we were a little. We were debating, yes, like, is that true? Like, uh, I think uh, Jacob said, well, success is kind of a charged word, right? Like, we all have ideas of what that means. Um, and last year, there was a question in one of the groups uh, from somebody, uh, they were asking one of the presenters what to do to grow their business and the principles. And the person said, you know, um, there are very, very talented actors that still have to wait tables. And it really impacted me, and the reason why it impacted me is because um, it was fresh, it felt very genuine, very open, <laughs> but also I think all of us get this idea of what success means. Right? Like, if I'm really successful, then what is that going to look like? If my marriage is successful, what is that going to look like? If my business is successful, what would that look like? Um, so I think we all agree. I don't know if you agree, Sue. Well, I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm not committed to it. <laughs> that we're just not too sure that every single human being is going to make lots of money, right, and have a mansion in the Mediterranean and all of that. So we just want to um, put that out. We're just not too sure about that. We're open to it. We're just not too sure about it. But when you were talking, um, what really um, resonated in me is that whether we have the mansion in the Mediterranean or not, all of us have this wonderful ability and capacity to feel contentment and peace of mind. <clears throat> so that's what we're calling success at the moment. Um, and how this capacity, this um, this particular form of mind which we feel as deep peace sometimes and relief is the very ingredient of who we are. And that what, whether that's very uh, prevalent to us or not, it's ever present. Even when we doubt it so much because it's our essence. And there are circumstances and there are situations uh, that most people would say it would be impossible for you to feel peace of mind under these circumstances. And yet we know, because of the stories that we've heard, that it is possible in any circumstance to have a sense of well-being and hope. So, are we all designed to experience peace of mind and hope and tranquility and uh, love in spite of the circumstances? Yes. Um, and creativity, right? 
creativity. We are creative human beings. We like to create, and we do create. And we create things that a moment before um, it came to our mind, it didn't exist. But because of the way that mind works, it just likes to show up in our lives. And when we know that, it makes life just a little bit more gentle, a little bit more uh, easy, a little bit more hopeful. As you know, we've had elections in the States. <laughs> And this was very close to my heart because my lovely husband and I voted for different people. <laughs> and it was so easy for me um, to get into all kinds of opinions about this. I mean, it just really fractured, felt to me like, my peace of mind. And for a moment, it fractured, I mean fractured, you know, um, how I saw not only my husband, but you know, the world. It was just so easy, I have to tell you, it was just so easy to not feel peace of mind and to not feel kind and to not feel loving towards this human being that I'm married to. And I asked, really? How could you possibly do this to us, right, to the world? Seriously, it was just very intense for me. Um, and then I was talking to some friends, and they're much worse than I am in that moment, and I just thought it was going to take a, a while for me to um, shed that, to shed that feeling. And it surprised me, it surprised me, you know, um, my lovely husband and I were together, and in spite of his decision, <laughs> because of the way that mine works, in the middle of my frustration, anger, blah, 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 there was this gleam of hope and of realizing that even in a situation that I thought was just so impossible, because of the way that we're designed, we can have a sense of connection to another human being, even if they do something as despicable as this. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to do it. Um, so I just love the experience of getting totally lost, um, losing my bearings, becoming judgmental, you know, all of those things. And then being convinced that I'm right, right? Being convinced that this is something that is going to take a long time. We might not fix this. And then, because of the way it works, it shows up. It shows up in spite of us, in spite of my opinions, in spite of anything. So I am sure that that's possible. I am sure that any one of us can have insight, can feel peace, can experience love, regardless of the circumstances. 
Oh, my name is Gabriella <laughs> And I don't care. Because <laughs> when you get to my age, you do forget. <laughs> so I looked at the title. Actually, I didn't type. Before I did that, I, I sort of um, glanced through this paper and I thought, oh, good, I'm speaking, you know, once a day. That's, that's kind of cool. That's okay. Um, and then I thought, um, wow. Look at that, I'm on a panel. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I should have told you before, but you're on a journey with me in my head. Now, years ago I went to Disney, um, so I can't promise the same experience, I'm sorry. <laughs> I will spit if you want me to, so you can feel the water. Um, and I'll come round and move the chairs if you want, so you'll feel all of that. So I'm sorry, it's not quite three or 70 or whatever they call it. Um, but this is what went on in my head. So I thought, wow, I found fame. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> it was a long conversation with Gabriella one time, in fact several times, about me wanting to be famous. So I thought, this is it. <laughs> I've made it. And not only that, but I'm going to be on stage with Gabriella. <laughs> wow. And Steph, oh my goodness, I've never even met him, but I've heard all about him. And Jacob, who I love anyway. Whatever. <laughs> Late or not, you know. <laughs> so that's what went through my head, and I haven't even really looked at the title. <laughs> so when I looked at it and I saw what it said, which I can't remember anyway, but um, something about succeeding. And I thought, oh my gosh, succeeding? What does that mean? And please note, they had a meeting without me. <laughs> they left me out. And I started to think, before I knew about that, I started to think about what on earth is succeeding? I'm not famous. I've never been famous. What am I going to sit here and talk about? With all of that, my name is Sue Latcher. And then I thought, oh, forget that. That's ridiculous. It's easy. You look it up. What does it mean to succeed? So that's what I did. I looked it up on my phone. And it said, to succeed is when you achieve something that you've been aiming for. It's if a plan or a piece of work succeeds, it is the results that you wanted. So I thought, well, that's kind of cool, because I sort of wanted to be famous, so if this is it, then I've made it, you know. But then I went further down the page, and it said, take over the throne. <laughs> so I thought, that's it. I don't even need them anymore. <laughs> And it reminded me of Trump. Because <laughs> he seems to get in everywhere, doesn't he? And he really did trump everything, didn't he? He really came out on top. Um, and I even put on my success clothes for you. Because I thought, I looked in the wardrobe and I thought, what could I wear that gives off this air of being successful? <laughs> Succeeding. I even put on a special perfume. It's called The One. <laughs> I didn't make it up, it's true. <laughs> oh, it smells good as well, see? It was successful. <laughs> but then it said something about management and, and business skills and that you need all of those to succeed. And I suddenly realized, wow, that's it. For me, what I heard and what I'd seen, which sounds weird, I know, was that there's something inside of you, 
And my husband said it so nicely this morning. He, I asked him this morning, actually, just to digress slightly. Um, the same subject, it's okay. And I asked him this morning, what, what does it mean to succeed? And he started to tell me about animals. And I, and I started to think, you oh, know, okay, it's a bit early. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have asked him. <laughs> he's got a bit of a cold, so maybe he's gone to his head. <laughs> um, and I thought, what have I got to do with an animal? <laughs> maybe that's how he sees me first thing in the morning. It's possible. <laughs> <laughs> but he sort of made sense, I think, um, so I'm going to put it into words of what I heard. And he said, well, you know, animals look at sort of, um, they wake up and, and their lives are very simple. And uh, they don't, uh, you know, they'll see, oh, food, eat, drink, whatever. And that and the, as human beings, we complicate things. And, and then he went on and said, you know, well, they don't look at it and say, oh, there's a tree. I must eat that tree from that tree. Which is true, they, you know, they're not, I, I don't think that they're creative. And that's the difference, isn't it? That as human beings, we're, we have the potential to be creative. And then he went on and he said, well, we have a spark inside us, don't we? And that really sort of resonated with me in such a way that I wrote it very big. It's very big. We have a spark inside. We have the ability to be creative. And, you know, success doesn't mean anything from the outside. Because we can look like we're successful. We can look and act and wear clothes and perfume that you think can make you look or feel successful. But it's nothing to do with that. Because we all have the ability to be whatever we want, whenever we want. Because we all have that creative streak inside us. Like your son. Mm -hmm. And I think that that potential that we have, is just huge for me. So, my name is Sue Latcham. And the beauty is that I can be whoever I want at any given moment. I think I've said enough. <laughs> My name is Jim, and um, as uh, these guys talked about, we uh, had a little meeting this morning where we discussed the, the topic of this panel. And success is a quite loaded word, I'd say, and to claim that we as human beings are designed to success, well, it, would, it requires a definition because um, it's obvious that we all got our own ways to go, right? And some feel comfortable running a huge best business, some feel comfortable being home raising a family, etc., etc. And I'm pretty sure that <clears throat> if we were to ask people all around, from all walks of life, how do you feel? Not how you're doing, but how you feel about your life. I'm pretty sure they would answer that question independently of how they're actually doing in life. So even though <clears throat> I may have built a huge company, earned millions of dollars, etc., etc., if you were to ask me right now, hey, how are you doing? I would actually feel how I'm doing. Or how are you, sorry. I would say, well, I'm okay kind of miserable. Oh, I'm doing great. But I would not answer the question depending on my circumstances in that moment. I would actually answer it depending on how I felt. Yeah? You might ask me again tonight. You might ask me again tomorrow. 
and you might get different answers. So, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that all of us, when we hear the word success, we might connect it with some stuff out there in the world, like I raised my family, my kids, I got this job I aimed for, I reached those goals, etc. But at the bottom, it, at the heart of it, what we're really aiming for is like the feeling of success. And that has nothing to do with whatever's going on outside in the world. That might just be a sense of doing well, feeling well, feeling joyful, like appreciating what's around us. We might not say, yeah, I'm a success. Like we might put other words to the feeling. But in my experience, it's very much the same goal that we all strive for. At the end of the day, we just want a sense of ease and happiness, hope, just a joy of being alive. Yeah? And what I've seen consistently in working with clients and in my own life and people around me is that that, what do you call, that goal is achievable for everyone. Like the sense of being at ease, the sense of doing okay, the sense of enjoying whatever is around, of being grateful for whatever's going on. That is something that we'll feel from in here. And that's, that is actually just a, a basic asset, you could say, of being a human being. Really. And what, what may come across, like what, what we're able to do instantly is of course to obscure that fact. So we might we got the, the, the ability to like think too much about it. Think our way out of our own well-being. Yeah? So when when people come to us, like we might work with people, it might just be a good friend, family, kids, whatever, and we can feel they're not okay, they're not in a good place. They feel Angry, frustrated, sad, depressed, anxious. We can feel that they are not quite in tune. They're not quite aligned with themselves. Oh my God, the alarm went off. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. We can feel that, right? It's a very natural, very normal thing. If our kids approach us and we can feel they're not quite in tune, oh, they, they might <clears throat> scream or shout, call us names, just be sad, be very quiet, and we can just feel oh, they're kind of out of tune. We might work with clients where they say, oh, I'm a screw up, my life is a mess, I screwed up everything, I'm no good, I'll never amount to anything. And we just know that that very moment, the real heart of the matter is it just lost up here. Yeah, and it doesn't feel good, but it's, it's, luckily it's just up here. Because if we, had, we were to clean up their whole life, we might never get through. But we know that when they like, find their way here, when they get back online, back in alignment with themselves, things will lighten up. And that mechanism is like a built-in system, just like Steph talked about, the guy who uh, would let go of the controls in the airplane, and the airplane would automatically autocorrect itself. We have that same mechanism inside, which is a good thing, because if we try to manage all our own emotions and thoughts and stuff, it's a never-ending work, never-ending work. And especially if we feel kind of low and life looks pretty grim, not, not, not much hope on the horizon. If we, from that 
low state of mind try to fix our own lives. Our own emotions try to work through all of our stuff. Well, good luck. That's a near ending story. So, the inbuilt mechanism will help us out as long as we just let go of the controls. And in that sense, I'm, I agree very much with the subject of this title today, that we humans have a, an inbuilt mechanism designed for, su for success. Not in any... I don't know whether we are built for success in, in, in the world out there, but in here, we are built not to suffer. <coughs> So to succeed in not feeling miserable might sound like a small feat, but that's actually a pretty awesome first step, yeah? Because if we feel miserable in here, the rest out there doesn't matter. You could own the world, but if you feel everything is horrible in here, you wouldn't care about it. So th that little first all-important step to feel good in here that's taken care of. And of course we got, we might get confused and we got the power to mess it all up and think ourselves into a, a hell hole, into misery and despair. But um, there's hope there. So that's why we gathered here to look in another direction. And I've seen that consistently and I'm guessing you have too and a lot of you work with clients as well and you've seen the promise in this and the hope and, and the ease of looking in that direction and seeing, okay, if we just start with the first step, not to be miserable, that's a pretty good start. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, okay. yeah, okay. Yeah. We're done talking here for now, but we got some time to go. So, if you have some, if you have some questions, or comments, or something you'd like to add, please feel free. Amanda. Got it. Got it there. So, if you want to raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone around to you. Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, actually getting the definition of what is success. I just want to relate my own story um, a little bit. When I was a young lad and still at school, uh, we used to in those days have um, career officers who would actually come around and talk about what you're going to do for the rest of your life and try and, and they asked me, what do you want to do? Nothing. <laughs> I, I, I had no interest in any particular thing. Um, and then I thought, even at that young age, I thought about success and what it may be. And to me, uh, I'd learned that I didn't like pain, uh, but I enjoyed pleasure. <laughs> and to me, that was quite simple, but I thought, well, that'll do for me. And I set about my life having as much pleasure as I could without being too selfish and trying to avoid pain as much as I could, uh, which may sound like a strange plan or a simple plan, but it's worked beautifully. When I look back on my life now, oh, I've laughed, I feel so good the majority of the time. I've had pain as well and different things. Um, so to me, looking at it, that would be success to me because that was my plan, that was my goal to feel good inside as much as I could and to avoid pain as much as I could. Uh, and I've managed to achieve that to a pretty good rate, so I think I've been successful. <laughs> Sorry, another thought came to me, which I'll have to tell you, which is um, sometimes you need to succeed. And thinking about Sue's husband talking about the animals this morning, and 
for those of you who were in the breakout session yesterday, uh, I just wanted to mention something about Rudy. Not the Rudy Kennard we all know here, <laughs> but the other Rudy, which is uh, Maureen's parrot. Okay. And it, it struck me during while you were all talking, is that if Rudy woke up one day with a very sore beak, then he would have to succeed that day. You know, I'm sorry, I just, I just, that's just what it struck me. I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. <laughs> and what was the question? <laughs> so it occurred to me while um, Jacob was talking that um, really I discovered something quite a few years ago whilst walking on a treadmill because that's part of my life walking on the treadmill <laughs> I'm never getting any thinner <laughs> um, but I used to do that at one stage so I could get away from saying to my children <laughs> and leave it to my husband <laughs> to do um, and I was listening actually um, to um, someone that's no longer alive called Wayne Dyer. And um, I'd been listening to him probably a thousand times. And that particular morning I woke up and I got ready to go on the treadmill and I was listening to the same, whatever you call it, MP3, audio, whatever. And same thing. I'd listened to it a thousand times, this was the thousand and first time, and the most darndest thing happened, because he changed the words. <laughs> he did, I'm serious. He said, let go. And something inside of me sort of dropped. Um, no, it wasn't. <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I let go. <laughs> I, I let go. I, I, I let go of everything seemed to sort of drop away from me. And actually what happened was that I was in a bubble. Um, not really a plug, but a plug. <laughs> because um, I'm writing a book, not Three Principles book, I'm just writing a book about my life since having my children, um, five of them. Actually, no, that's not true. I didn't have the last one. <laughs> no, I didn't have the last one, sorry. Um, I mean, I have five children, but I adopted one, sorry. And I write about being in a bubble and um, being in this bubble. And I had that um, I had that once before with one of my children when I went into a bubble. That's another story. I don't want to talk about it now. <laughs> I'll talk about it if you want, but I don't know. <laughs> if it's going to make me famous, I'll definitely do it. <laughs> and I've got a hat. I'll put a hat down. <laughs> Um, the thing is that I did let go and I, I kept looking over my shoulder for a long time where Sue Latchman was because I thought that the horrible old cow uh, was going to come back in and jump into my body again. Um, she does from time to time. She's not very nice. Sorry, Frank. <laughs> publicly, I'm saying sorry. It's very nice of me. I've never said sorry publicly before. <laughs> Um, but at that moment, I had absolutely everything I need, I needed, and I have at this moment everything I need. And for me, 
at this very moment, I guess, if you want to put a label to it or a word to it, that is success, succeeding, I don't know if there is a word to put to it. But I ask you to reflect for a second and think, yeah. do you have everything you need in this moment? And I know you do, because we all do. But very often, we get caught up in the minutiae of life and what we think is expected of us from other people or goals and expectations that we put on ourselves from outside. Like you, Steph, with yourself. And honestly, we actually have two children with Down syndrome. So we you know, also had a lot of expectations um, and then lowered them and lowered them and then thought, well, maybe we should look higher. So, you know, I hear that. But you know, when all of that is gone, we have everything we need. That surely is success. Ping the bubble. Hello. Uh, <laughs> just echoing what you guys have been saying, really, and what I've been seeing more and more over the last few years about what is success. I know for myself, I used to, when I was young, there was all these, like, again, I usually it was external, external, it was linked to external circumstances, but I'm seeing more and more of people are just, uh, the word peace, peace comes to mind to me quite a lot, you know, there's that, there's that term right, on gravestones, rest in peace, whereas we can, I'm seeing more and more it's possible to rest in peace while you're alive, we just, we just forget constantly by getting caught up in our thinking minds that it, we can't be at peace until there's this, this is in place within our lives. Whether it's a relationship, whether it's money, whether it's the car, whether it's, there's, in, there's infinite things we can, we can let go of our peace for, because we think, well, we can't pick it back up until we've got that. And I, I think I heard somebody, there's a, a non dual teacher I heard speaking about peace once, and somebody asked her, she, I think they said to her, uh, Do you think there'll ever be peace, peace in the world? And her, her reply was, peace, peace is already here, we just don't allow it. And that just came to mind a lot when you guys were speaking. Thank you. You know, it, at the beginning of the year, um, I was talking to Marianne, and we were having this conversation about what was our plan for the year, as far as work. And we both said, we have no plan, we don't know what's going to happen. I think we had moments of peace, and we also had lots of moments of like, oh shit, what are we going to be doing here, right? Are we allowed to curse here? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, I remember kind of like thinking, okay, if this thing about the energy and the intelligence of the universe is true, then okay, show up. You know, show up. And I felt often. Um, my ego or something, kind of like peeking through, right? It's like, well, you should have a plan. Like Don has classes everywhere, and you know, Mark has classes, and Jack has classes, and then I would get on Facebook. It's like, oh my God, this is going on, this is going on. 
And I remember I was like, every time after I checked Facebook, I would feel a lot more insecure. <laughs> Which is a phenomenon, you know. <laughs> it happens in the world. And I remember getting distracted with what everybody else was doing. You know, there are these wonderful classes on retreats and, you know, trips to the moon, they're teaching principal while they're going to the moon. And I was really frightened. I was really like, whoa, whoa. And then, you know, I'm so pleased with myself because I just kind of grabbed myself and I was like, okay, no, you're gonna stay here. You're not gonna look at Facebook. You're just not gonna get distracted. And then the little, you know, the other little thing was like, you really need to start planning and the whole thing. And it, it was kind of like moments of a lot of peace and a lot of trust and moments of a lot of insecurity and having this impulse to take control. Right? It's like, oh my gosh, I don't know. You know, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Um, and so the year happened. And it just turned out so beautifully. It just turned out so beautifully. And um, sometimes, even if it doesn't turn out beautifully, I have these moments where I feel like there, there is this intelligence right underneath. It's not so obvious to us, but it's always at work. And it has this beautiful plan. I mean, I don't know if it's a plan or not, but it's working. It's working. It's kind of like working. Um, sometimes I can't see it. You know, there are some times where I'm like, oh, I don't know if how this is going to turn out. And it always surprises me. It just always surprises me. And it's a relief. It's a relief when I really see it at work, when I can sense when I can feel it in my gut, right? It's like, oh, I don't have to worry about just every detail in my life because we are mind in action. And sometimes, even if I don't want to have an insight because of the way it works, it happens. And sometimes, even if I'm lost in my thinking, clarity shows up because it's just the way it works. Uh, there doesn't need to be a condition in my state of mind for things to work. I don't have to know the principles for mine to work. My plants don't know about mine, and they do a fine job every year. They produce a lot of tomatoes. Some of them die though. But Without a formal knowing, because it is really true, our true essence, it just shows up. And I think that's so hard for us to see sometimes, because we're so accustomed to the doing, to the planning. You know, I have to let go of this thinking for our insight to happen, and that is not true. Because we're talking about the intelligence of all, and that's what we are. And that's so, you know, that's so that I don't even have to come down for it to be alive. So I just love those moments where, you know, I see that. So what if, what if it's really true? that the very essence of who we are has this amazing wisdom and an amazing creativity and that we really don't have to worry about anything in our lives. What if that's true? What kind of uh, lunches would we have? And what kind of business meetings would we have? And what kind of uh, conversations with our loved ones would we have with our husbands that vote on the other side of the road? And, you know, what would that be like if that's really true? 
What if you don't have to be famous to be well? <laughs> Oh, then just a quick anecdote um, about success and the cultural sort of loaded aspect of it. Um, about seven months now, I was here on honeymoon and we was with my wife just up the road at a Nepalese restaurant. And there was about eight to ten expats all enjoying themselves on a large table. And when they found out we were married all on our honeymoon, um, they were really friendly. Um, uh, paid for this guy coming with some roses and they bought three of them for us. And uh, we come in after them and when they were on their way out, the guy at the end, big chap, leaned down and said, take a tip from a businessman, keep buying and selling houses all your life until you can retire and then walk out. And first of all, I thought, well, I didn't ask for any advice. <laughs> but, and I didn't get the chance to give him any advice either. I just thought in my head at that moment, well, I'm nearly half your age and I'm already where you've, <laughs> what took you all your life to get to, so. So it is subjective and, and it is loaded, but, but it is, it's the, it's the definition of, well, if you don't need the external world, you don't have to map out something that I need this and I need that. So I can do this by such and such a time. Uh, keep you busy and focused. Um, but it's not for everyone, you know. So it's that, it's similar to that abundance. That's the interpretation of abundance. Uh, the, when you feel well, uh, it's a sense of accomplishment contentment, like you say, and you don't need anything from the outside world to, to, to express that. So yeah, no, I just wanted to share that little story. <laughs> I'd just like to thank Jacob and Sue and Gabriella and Steph. Um, so can we do that?